What is a person? If you were asked to describe what a person is, what would you reply? Well, they have eyes, hands, legs and feet, a heart, lungs, stomach and intestines. They have a mind, thoughts, emotions, hopes and desires, relationships, possessions, memories. They're seeking something, a purpose, meaning. We all have some idea, as a priori as it may seem, of the answer to this question. Although it may sound like, to some degree, a metaphysical quandary, a spiritual curiosity best left for philosophers pondering alone to themselves in the moonlight, it is, in fact, precisely the opposite. To have a coherent model of what a person is, even if it's implicit rather than coherently articulated, sits right at the heart of how we relate to ourselves and other people. This is especially important for the caring professions and healing arts. Without an appropriate model of what a person is, the amount of good they can give to the person in need is significantly reduced, or even significant harm can be done, such as evident through suggestion. In this video, we are going to explore this question to the deepest resolution we possibly can, taking us from cutting-edge psychodynamics to the brain, the genome, down into the quantum world, and even outside of it entirely. To begin our journey, let us map out the road ahead. In Chapter 1, we will construct a meta-model map to allow us to maintain internal consistency when exploring different levels of analysis, description and explanation. This is a non-negotiable starting position, the map we will use as our guide. In Chapter 2, we will voyage from the genome up to the so-called psychoid boundary, piecing together the biological correlates of human psychodynamics. In Chapter 3, we will draw on the work of Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose to explore the quantum basis of consciousness and, indeed, complexes. In Chapter 4, we will tie all of our journey together to develop a quantum model of neurosis. Finally, in Chapter 5, we will discuss what the road ahead might, and indeed must, look like for definitively answering the question, what is a person? The answer to the question, what is a person, surely is all of the above and simultaneously so. A person has a heart, a mind, emotions, dreams and relationships, and much more, all at the same time in an interrelated system. This was the great insight from Professor George Engel, codified in his biopsychosocial model of human health. To Engel, his patients had a biology, and they had a psychology, nested within a social world. A change in something biological would influence something in the psychology, which would have ramifications socially. Indeed, the same is true for any entry point in the stack, leading to outputs in multiple places at differing so-called resolutions. The genesis point for the biopsychosocial model 
was rooted in Engel's childhood, in a phrase once uttered to him and his brother by their father. Where you think you stand determines what you think you see. To illustrate how essential this point is for health, let us suppose for a moment that there is such a thing as a clinical philosopher. Say, someone had been influenced entirely by René Descartes' meditations on first philosophy. How would such a therapist model you? Doctor, I don't feel so good. And how do you know that you don't feel so good? Um, well, because uh, I literally feel it. Well, from where I stand, your feelings could well be an illusion. My course of treatment is thus. Spend a month doubting everything that you possibly can. Doubt your ailment away. Through absolute absurdum, it's easy to see the necessity of having a working meta-model of human health that has the capacity for both accurate prediction and therapeutic efficacy. Where you think you stand determines what you think you see. For a hypothetical orthodox Cartesian psychotherapist, the result is thus. What about actual therapeutic schools, however? What might they be looking for? To apply Engel once more here, where you think you stand, that is, your model of choice, determines what you think you see, the so-called neurotic issue in the patient. So, Doctor, I don't feel so good. I stand exclusively within Freud's collected works, so I am going to look for an Oedipus complex. The transference will tell me all I need to know about what repetition compulsion is being acted out in this illness. I stand exclusively within Adler's collected works, so I am going to look for superiority or inferiority behaviour, their style of life, and social interest. I stand exclusively within Jung's collected works. I wonder which archetypes are clashing in this person. They probably have an issue with their shadow, which, upon addressing completely, they can move on to integrate their anima or animus. Of course, this does not necessarily describe individual practitioners. Not at all. But it does describe the theory and education in certain schools of training. All three hypothetical therapists are seeing the same person, but their model is shaping their perceptions. As all three of them could be effective, controlling of course for context and within their own set bandwidth, does this mean that they are all correct? Maybe they are, and we should adopt an eclectic worldview. Before jumping to conclusions, for us to go any deeper into the nature of a person from a therapeutic perspective, let us instead make a knight's move around the problem. Steve and Pauline Richard's psychosystems analysis model of depth psychology has, right at its core, a meta-modeling philosophy called dialectical syncretism. This is a means to keep the model open at all times for information flowing in from clinical empiricism, alternative ways of modeling observable phenomena, and new advances in scientific discovery, whilst also keeping the model internally consistent. Thus, it is not eclectic. A psychosystems analyst does not simply choose to use a Freudian model today and a Jungian view tomorrow. It maintains internal consistency whilst preventing ossification. Thus, within psychosystems analysis, 
any one observation in a snapshot of space and time is an invocation of the Engelian principle. Where you think you stand determines what you think you see. Thus, the psychosystems analyst is simultaneously parallel processing what they think they see, a collapsed waveform to use a metaphor, with an eye for the entire biopsychosocial context across time and in the moment of an individual. The figure is never lost for the ground. Jung himself said that an individual should read Freud and Adler before him. The foundation of his model rested with these other two great clinicians. Thus, in psychosystems analysis, one can see the Freudian, Adlerian and Jungian dynamics within a person simultaneously as three separate so-called collapsed waveforms that exist as figures against the larger ground which they all result from. In the original core biopsychosocial model, Engel deliberately left the psychology box empty. He simply called it the person, so that it could be used by any psychological school of thought. Steve and Pauline, through 40 years of clinical experience each, and with Engel's support, placed an internally consistent psychodynamic model in this box, whilst simultaneously leaving it open for further developments. Professor Ernest Rossi also supported Stephen Pauline with, additionally, including some of his insights on state-dependent memory, learning and behaviour and psychosomatic transduction into the model too. Thus, psychosystems analysis stands as an internally consistent means of modelling human health that has both psychodynamic and medical depth and biopsychosocial breadth that also remains open. In any one moment, it is a collapsed waveform, so-called, by necessity of human perception, but it has the capacity to uncollapse and then recollapse again when more context is gleaned. Of course, this channel is called Young to Live By. Indeed, the core psychodynamic model developed by Stephen Pauline builds upon Jung's map of the psyche. Yet, psychosystems analysis is not Jungian in the orthodox means. For example, complexes, a Jungian concept, are the core of the day-to-day -day working of a psychosystems analyst, but when we describe them, we do not go looking for a so-called archetypal core as originally described by Jung. Whatever a complex is, it is simply what it is, and we model it as best we possibly can based on the reality in front of us. To explore this for a moment, as a transitionary point on our journey onwards towards the biology and quantum realm, let us investigate the following question. Where in a person is a complex? Regardless of which definition someone wants to take, all schools who use the term will agree that a complex is present in the psychology of an individual. However, the issues begin to arise when we cross the so-called psychoid boundary down into the biology. Where in the biology is the informational correlate of a complex? If we take an orthodox Jungian perspective, by necessity we have to go looking for an archetype. The wise old man, perhaps. Which neurons proteins, RNA, which genes correspond informationally to the wise old man archetype? How about the shadow, 
Is there a shadow of the brain? The answer to this is a resounding no. But that does not mean, de facto, that the concept is incorrect to begin with. The model of a shadow has functional validity, insofar as it theoretically describes observed psychological and psychosocial phenomena within its own bandwidth, at the resolution of the psyche. But as soon as we drop into biology, we have three choices which face us. We ignore biology entirely, we drop the concept of the shadow entirely, or we take a more nuanced approach of metaphorically collapsing the waveform into a different level of analysis, description, and explanation, and seeing how well the concept stands. The reasoning here rests on the very reasonable supposition that a psychological model with functional validity will have its correlates in biology. If that is taken for truth, then the odyssey can continue. If not, ossification is sure to set in within the model. Instead, it is best to press onwards, with the eye of a pioneer. What we can say with confidence as a first principle of modelling is that the concept, say, of a complex, is not synonymous with the lived experience it describes. A complex is not real, in the sense of it being literally a thing in itself, to borrow a phrase from Kant. It is, instead, a model. It describes an observable phenomena and given a label. Thus, building on Engel and Rossi, Steve and Pauline's psychosystems analysis describes the model known as a complex as a bio-psychosocial phenomena. Alas, it seems that we have come full circle. If we wish to answer the question, where is a complex in the biology, the chemistry, physics and quantum world, it is best that we begin our journey anew from the other side of the psychoid boundary and work our way back up to dovetail with the observed psychodynamics. Every human being begins life as a single cell, the newly formed zygote as the product of a fertilization event between a sperm and ovum. From this moment, the lifespan begins to unfold. One cell divides into two. They then divide, and so on, eventually resulting in a recognizable human being. Every cell in the human body contains the same DNA. Depending on which genes are transcriptionally active, the cell will take on a discrete, differentiated type. For example, a neuron in the central nervous system, or a cone cell in the eye. Thus, the template for all human potential must be present in this very first snapshot of time. No matter what happens across the lifespan, the genome as such of an individual remains intact, despite individual cellular differences through DNA damage or mutation events. Thus, the genome provides the bandwidth of all possible experience. Everything that happens to a person, from within or from without, must have its origins as a template in the genome. This must be the case. It is DNA that remains the same throughout the lifespan, 
the proteins and RNA produced by gene expression all decay and must be continually reproduced by the genome. Thus, it stands that the genome is the source of everything in template form that we consider to be human, within the so-called collapsed waveform of biology. We can go deeper than this, and we shall, but for the moment we shall take this as our new starting point. Through the process of transcription, initiation through elongation, and finally termination, a molecule of RNA is produced from an open reading frame in the genome. The RNA product is a direct informational correlate of that which is held in the DNA triplet code. Transcription is literally a transcribing process of one form of information into another. The transcriptome then, that is, the sum total of all RNA in a cell, is thus its own level of analysis, description and explanation above the genome. Thus the bio part of the biopsychosocial stack is de facto expanded. But where do we go from here? Well, RNA can be considered as either protein coding or non-coding. The information it contains has one of two different discrete fates. If it is protein coding, then it undergoes the process of translation. Again, through initiation, elongation and termination, a ribosome or series of ribosomes creates a polypeptide, that is functionally a protein, with an amino acid sequence that directly corresponds to the codon sequence in the RNA. This protein can be further modified by downstream intracellular processing before it is ready and quote-unquote active to carry out its biological function. For the purposes of psychology, perhaps this protein is tyrosine hydroxylase, the enzyme which converts the amino acid tyrosine to L-dopa. This is heavily simplified, but say, for the sake of argument, ignoring all off-target effects, if this protein is compartmentally downregulated at the level of transcription or translation, then the global net total of the neurotransmitter dopamine will be lower, thus exerting a corresponding psychoactive qualia psychodynamically. If this was localized in the Panksepian seeking system, we'd expect to see an internal depressogenic effect as the system was dialed down. Such a model, as a general principle, is intuitive. After all, ingesting recreational substances generates a psychoactive effect. The information transduction from biology up into psychology is direct and clear. Protein is, and must be, very close to the so-called psychoid boundary. In fact, it is completely reasonable to assert that it is the closest quote-unquote real form of matter that corresponds to this barrier, if we consider the role of microtubules, as we will do so very soon. To go back to our RNA for a moment, it could also be non-coding. It is known from work in yeast, one of the most powerful models of eukaryotic biochemistry, that the primary function of long non-coding RNAs is epigenetic regulation of gene expression and a very large, though unknown, number of genes have their expression regulated in this manner. <laughs>
Indeed, as eukaryotic complexity increases with phylogenetic time, the proportion of the genome which encodes these non-coding RNAs increases. Thus, what makes an organism complex is not simply the result of protein coding genes, as might initially have been intuited. By deduction, the regulatory regions must play a substantial role in making a human human, including neuronally and psychologically. These non-coding RNAs can exert their regulatory effect at any stage along the gene expression pathway, either by acting as transcription factors themselves, or, for example, as sequence-specific suppressors as part of the RNA interference system. On screen is a table taken from Till et al. 2018, showing some of the known epigenetic functions of long non-coding RNA in yeast. You could pause the video and take a look, or have a look at the paper in the description. The bottom line is that genomic regions correspond to regulation of the expression pathway of other genomic regions to protein. So, we have genomic regions that correspond to a psychological qualia, and genomic regions which modify the pathway of expression leading to these qualia. These will be differentially expressed in different cells. For example, the Pansepian seeking system has a different transcriptomic and resultant proteomic profile to the fear system, and, when electrically stimulated, results in a different qualia of consciousness. Thus, we see the power of a system's approach in full force. Genome, transcription, transcriptomic regulation, translation, translational regulation, cellular function, psychology, and, of course, vice versa. The complexities of each step, for the sake of this video's length, has been omitted, as well as other additional steps, such as splicing. But, as a final point here, one genomic open reading frame can give rise to an enormous array of RNA and protein products within the mathematical parameters allowed by the sum total of regulators along its expression pathway. So, for psychology, it is very reasonable to assert that one genomic open reading frame can give rise to an enormous array of psychological qualia. Broadly, instincts, as described psychologically, will have their core genomic informational representation in protein coding genes, conserved across phylogenetic time, with a bandwidth of regulation present in potential in the non-coding regions. Just as an example, we know that this is true from knockout studies in mice. Innate behavioural patterns of response, that is what we would call in psychodynamics an instinct, can be altered through modifying the expression of certain protein coding regions in the genome. Complexes then, as acquired over the lifespan, and having an instinctual core, as observed by Stephen Pauline as building on the work of Jung, must have a genomic profile that is different, but downstream related to these protein coding genes. Considering the relative abundance of non-coding regions in the human genome, dovetailing with our relative eukaryotic complexity, with strong probability, the informational correlate of a complex at the genetic level will be epigenetic modifiers of existing instinctual pathways. They are learned 
that is a product of the epigenetic dialectic between the genome and environment, but also able to be sustained across the lifespan. Thus, their potential to form and sustain themselves is in the non-coding regions. At this resolution, we could consider complexes a shape of instinct as determined at the level of transcription. Thus, we have answered as a broad outline to the best of our current knowledge across psychodynamics and molecular biology where a complex is. It has informational representation in social relationships within the psyche and, by necessity, in the proteome, transcriptome, epigenome, and genome. We have remained consistent to the biopsychosocial core of psychosystems analysis, drawing on psychodynamics as our journey down, and molecular biology as our path up to the so-called psychoid boundary. Somewhere in the midst of this, our opening question echoes forward through time. What is a person? We've missed something crucial. The experience of being a human being. That can only be explained with an investigation into the nature of consciousness. There have been many attempts to explain what consciousness, by one name or another, is since the dawn of the pre-Socratics, stretching all the way through to the present. One of the most popular ideas in modern cognitive neuroscience is that consciousness is an epiphenomenon resulting from an action potential signal within the brain. Take a computer. At core, it's a series of transistors connected to inputs and outputs. From one angle, the brain appears to be something remarkably similar. Sensory inputs, motor outputs, and an electrochemical circuit of synaptic transistors. Thus, one of the most popular hypotheses today is that consciousness is computational. Theoretically, then, it would be possible to create a conscious computer. From the psychodynamic work of Stephen Pauline, drawing on the hypnotherapeutic and psychoanalytic tradition, the psyche is known to not be a single, unified experience, as will be explored in the following chapter. Thus, from this and several other substantial indicators, we are inclined to a different view, one that dovetails with the observed psychodynamics. Roger Penrose, the Nobel laureate physicist, has reasoned that consciousness is not simply a computer. We recommend reading his book, The Emperor's New Mind, for the mathematical background to his proposition. Building on this, Penrose and Stuart Hameroff proposed in the 1990s that consciousness is therefore not an epiphenomenon of electrical activity in the brain directly. Instead, in their pioneering papers, they outlined a quantum model rooted not in the synapses but in the microtubules. To introduce this idea, in short, they draw on an observation that the threshold needed for a neuron involved in conscious brain processes to fire varies from spike to spike. They reason that some factor, in addition to the synaptic inputs and membrane potential, must be at work in order to account for this observed deviation from the standard Hodgkin-Huxley integrate-and-fire model. <laughs>
Their model, the evidence for which has only increased since its initial conception, states that this missing factor is, in itself, synonymous with consciousness. The mainstream current of opinion for the longest time within biology was that quantum events could not take place in the so-called warm, wet and noisy soup of biochemistry. This opinion turned out to be false. There are many well-described so-called quantum phenomena essential for life processes, as documented in magnetoreception in birds, photosynthesis, and many others. I recommend the book Life on the Edge, The Coming of Age of Quantum Biology by Jim Al-Khalili and John Joe McFadden for a brilliant overview of the field of quantum biology. Thus, for Hammeroff and Penrose's Orch-OR theory, all cards remained on the table. It is feasible that quantum events could take place within the brain. As a transitionary point to the main thesis, Hammeroff describes the physicist Herbert Froelich's proposition that feasible quantum events within living systems could take place within coherent dipole oscillations in non-polar regions of geometrical lattices. Essentially, these environments would be protected from the warm, wet and noisy cytoplasm. Hammeroff proposed that microtubules in neurons offer just such an environment, and together with Penrose put forward a hypothesis that states that microtubules are capable of existing in a quantum superposition of different geometric configurations. At a given threshold of time, this superposition becomes unstable and the waveform collapses one way or the other, depending on the variable gravitational component of the matter composing the field. This orchestrated by microtubule alpha lattices objective reduction, or ORCH-OR, of the waveform is stated to be synonymous with a given qualia of consciousness. These OR events can link up together via entanglement, most obviously so through gap junctions between neurons, creating a field of consciousness. Not as something ethereal and outside of space and time per se, but as a definite quantum event of superposition collapse. I've linked Hammeroff and Penrose's updated paper from 2014 in the description below, which is highly recommended. The implications of this for the place of consciousness in the universe is enormous. The Orch-OR theory leads to the conclusion that proto-consciousness is everywhere whenever an OR collapse of a waveform takes place, which is everywhere and all the time. The complexity of the brain thus allows for a localized field of OR events to magnify together into a unified experience composed of individual qualia from individual ORs. These conscious qualia are, in this theory, an inbuilt fundamental part of the universe, like mass, charge, length and spin. Indeed, writing in the famous 1944 text What is Life, Schrodinger put it thus, Living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics, hitherto unknown, which, however, once they have been revealed, will form just as integral a part of science as the former. To some degree, though not exactly directly, this is exactly what the Orch-OR theory states. Conscious qualia are a fundamental part of the universe. Upon quick reflection, 
How could it be otherwise? No other explanation has ever been put forward, reasonably, to the contrary. I amusingly brought Descartes in earlier, but now, with the greatest respect, I wish to paraphrase his great initial insight. I think, therefore, I am. Or, in other words, I have a conscious experience, therefore, I am. Is it possible to drop even deeper than this, the quantum world, in the biopsychosocial, or now, quantum biopsychosocial stack? Well, in The Road to Reality, Penrose writes, Plato made it clear that the mathematical propositions, the things that could be regarded as unassailably true, referred not to actual physical objects, but to certain idealised entities. He envisaged that these ideal entities inhabited a different world, distinct from the physical world. Today, we might refer to this world as the platonic world of mathematical forms. Physical structures, such as squares, circles or triangles cut from papyrus, or marked on a flat surface, or perhaps cubes, tetrahedra, or spheres carved from marble, might conform to these ideals very closely, but only approximately. The actual mathematical squares, cubes, circles, spheres, triangles, etc. would not be a part of the physical world, but would be inhabitants of Plato's idealised mathematical world of forms. Penrose then continues, The mathematical forms of Plato's world clearly do not have the same kind of existence as do ordinary physical objects, such as tables and chairs. They do not have spatial locations, nor do they exist in time. Objective mathematical notions must be thought of as timeless entities and are not to be regarded as being conjured into existence at the moment that they are first humanly perceived. Finally, a little later, Penrose says, Mathematical existence is different not only from physical existence, but also from an existence that is assigned by our mental perceptions. Yet, there is a deep and mysterious connection with each of those other two forms of existence, the physical and the mental. In the diagram on screen, I have schematically indicated all of these three forms of existence, the physical, the mental, and the platonic mathematical, as entities belonging to three separate worlds, drawn schematically as spheres. So, indeed, we can drop beneath or rather outside of the biopsychosocial stack into the so-called platonic world. Drawing on this idea, Steve Richards proposes, as an intuition, that these so-called platonic forms project themselves into space-time at the level of the Planck scale. That is, the smallest possible fundamental measure of anything, space and time. At this resolution, we aren't dealing with a so-called psychoid boundary any longer. No, instead, we're looking at a potential platonic space-time boundary. If consciousness is a fundamental phenomenon of the universe, it is not unreasonable to hypothesize that it is indeed consciousness as a quantum field event itself that acts as this barrier between the world of the platonic and the world of matter. Jung himself wrote that space and time were relative to the psyche. Although perhaps an odd sounding statement, this is technically true. Our mental perceptions do indeed interact with the space-time continuum to relay us a moment-by-moment -moment snapshot experience. 
Hammeroff and Penrose quote the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead here, who, as if by synchronicity, is perhaps most famous for stating that all of the European philosophical tradition is best conceptualised as a series of footnotes to Plato, by aligning with his belief that mental activity is a process of discrete, individual, repeating, quote-unquote, occasions. Thus, consciousness and time, at least in perception, are intimately interlinked. So, so far we have explored the meta-modeling process within psychosystems analysis and journeyed up from the very platonic world itself up to the genome and up still to the so-called psychoid boundary, exploring the quantum nature of consciousness along the way. It's time to unify all of these threads together. It's time to explore the quantum and molecular nature of neurosis. The great French clinician Pierre Janet was significantly credited by Freud, Breuer and Jung. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, Janet's contributions have been almost forgotten, assimilated as a footnote into the very foundations of the later psychoanalytic traditions. The importance of Janet's work is brilliantly illustrated in both Ellen Berger's Discovery of the Unconscious and by a collection of papers written by John Ryan Huell, which I've linked in the description. Janet should be remembered for the almost unparalleled insights he brought into the phenomenological nature and mechanics of consciousness and of hypnosis. Most apt for our investigation here is Janet's observation that dissociation of consciousness is a normal, natural and healthy phenomenon. Anyone can check this for themselves phenomenologically, drift off into a daydream, or perform self-hypnosis, and you'll notice that you, as in what we normally refer to as ego consciousness, appears to take on multiple discrete nodal points. This, of course, is how hypnosis works, as has been described by Steve Richards. Through dissociation, the ego becomes a participant observer of itself. Janet called these so-called nodal points subnuclei. Jung's pioneering work on complexes used this idea as its foundation. During his and Franz Ricklin's word association test investigations, they observed that ego consciousness seemed to be intruded upon by a split-off part of consciousness, acting autonomously, all on its own. A splinter psyche of sorts. To note, this is not the same thing as multiple personalities. The natural dissociation of consciousness, in contrast to this, is normal. Rossi's work showed that these so-called state-dependent memory, learning and behaviour were indeed just that, state-dependent and maintained by messenger molecules, such as hormones, using the hypothalamus as the psychobiological relay point, up into psychology and down into biology, and vice versa. Steve and Pauline's clinical psychophysiological work, using psychotherapeutic and hypnotherapeutic methods, as well as clinical capnography, built the model of complexes up further by introducing a taxonomy and dynamic bandwidth for describing their activity. They can be identified with, that is, within the self-concept, aligned to consciousness, or non-aligned entirely. They have an affective, instinctual core, which dynamically appear 
to respond to the environment. Blood pH, respiration rate, current ego Miller number contents, and memory, all autonomously. Again, many videos on the Young to Live By channel and Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook describe this work in great detail. So in being short here, I am presuming that you are familiar with the concept. To describe where a complex is, our transitionary question, therefore, it is clear that they have informational representation at all levels of the biopsychosocial stack, but they form initially within ego consciousness. To repeat, complexes have their etiology, their genesis point, within consciousness itself. Drawing on Hammeroff and Penrose's Orch OR theory, therefore, we have an implicit working hypothesis for the dynamic quantum profile of complexes. If ego consciousness is represented as an entangled field of OR events within microtubules, then complexes must form as a field that is, functionally, from the perspective of healthy ego consciousness, split off. All this would take, theoretically, would be a certain description of microtubule configuration or action potential profile at the resolution of the proteome, such as one corresponding to immense stress in a traumatic event, that splits off one part of the field from the other. One possible means through which this could occur is by altering the geometry of pre- and post-synaptic neurons through neurotransmitter release, inhibition, reuptake enzyme inhibition, or upregulation at the resolution of post-translation events due to its speed, postsynaptic receptor alterations, or all of the above. Indeed, it might also occur simply through altering the biochemistry between gap junctions via microtubule events, as these are an essential component of mediating the entanglement field. One nanometer for the facilitation of quantum events can make all the difference. Thus, both the normally considered ego consciousness and split off fields can be active simultaneously, allowing for Steve and Pauline's model of complexes to find a comfortable home in the quantum world. The complex thus sits as a non-coding genomic region manifesting as an epigenetically altered shape of instinct at the molecular level. A split-off orc or event in a moment triggers intracellular signaling towards a self-sustaining net global epigenetic profile, continually reproducing itself at the resolution of transcription, probably in large part through the action of non-coding RNAs that exert an influence upstream of microtubules. Challenges to this hypothesis will surely orbit around the definition of consciousness. Indeed, this is why I opened the previous chapter with a brief discussion on the hypothesized computational nature of consciousness. In cognitive neuroscience, consciousness, as phenomenological, is considered to be an ego-exclusive phenomenon. Through Janet's work on dissociation and subnuclei of consciousness, and Professor Yak Pangsep and Professor Mark Solmes's contribution that affect itself is a form of consciousness, the basis of what we refer to as ego consciousness, that consciousness is multidimensional and multi-compartmental. Thinking is simply an afterthought to an affective experience. The latter is two milliseconds faster than the former. Of course, this does not implicitly mean that the unconscious, as instead better conceptualized 
as a relative form of consciousness is necessarily phenomenological. But bringing in Orch OR once again, we can see that, to some degree, it is. With a given OR event, the intracellular geometry of the neuron in question is altered down at the nanometer level at many points along the microtubule. This is theoretically enough to influence not only the firing of action potentials, but also the gene expression pathways we discussed earlier through changing the shuttling pathways of intracellular components across the interior of the cell. Thus, consciousness itself, as a quantum collapse, could very feasibly alter which genes are turned on and off epigenetically. This will take place at the resolution of the proteome first, which is then relayed back to the epigenome. Thus, events within consciousness have a very feasible, immediate connection to gene expression. It is also feasible that chromatin itself, that is, the span of DNA as such composing a chromosome, could be opened and closed by such ORCH-OR events, or even through entanglement with histone DNA interactions in closed chromatin, literally initiating the opening of the chromatin and therefore transcription at a distance. Literally, these are transacting events as described in biology. So much becomes possible and I will be exploring this field in great professional detail in my upcoming book, which I hope to have released a little later this year. At the resolution of the brain then, to emphasize, these events will be split off from one another. More than likely, one set of neurons will correspond to the original affective form of consciousness with its own inbuilt teleology in line with gene expression, instinct, perception, and memory. The other set, however, with connections upstream to the original so-called source of the instinct in question, will correspond to the complex, almost as if frozen in time, with its own set point of adaptation, rooted in a transcriptionally active epigenetic profile. In line with Hameroff and Penrose, consciousness is a spectrum-style event that can build up to greater intensity or decrease down to simply being a proto-experience. Thus, when complexes intrude in word association tests, they might, in a proto-sentient manner, literally be doing so. They do not have the same level of consciousness of the Miller number foci of the ego. Far from it. However, their trickiness and adaptiveness in real time could feasibly be rooted in this so-called proto-consciousness. Thus, we may find that they are split off only through one single integrate and fire neuron. In my opinion, Steve and Pauline Richards psychosystems analysis is a watershed moment in the history of psychodynamics, due in large part, though not limited to, the inclusion of dialectical syncretism right at its core. As Nietzsche famously said in one of his more proto-psychodynamic moments, all philosophies are a product of the autobiography of their founder. What Nietzsche didn't say, however, was that this leads to the inevitable ossification of a model in line with the personal myth of the person who created it. Dialectical syncretism makes a knight's move around this problem and allows the model to be breathed alive afresh 
with each new individual who studies it, and with each new discovery. Dialectical syncretism does not just apply to psychodynamic ideas. It's relevant, too, within the so-called hard sciences. Sometimes the specialism within any one given scientific field can, in itself, become neurotic if the other disciplines are not considered. If a structural biologist cannot engage in dialectical syncretism by one name or another with a theoretical physicist, or vice versa, then the potential from their individual discoveries is de facto capped within level, and unnecessarily so. Thus, the future emerges on the frontiers, the edges between disciplines. For example, wherever one finds a dipole in a biological system, they're immediately simultaneously in the domain of classical biology, organic chemistry, and quantum physics. In reality, what human beings call an individual field is simply the functional metaphorical collapse of the waveform of their perceptions, like some therapists with their locked-in modality to a particular ossified model. The future will surely belong to the Renaissance spirit of platonic intuition, followed by cross-modal Aristotelian verification in the fields that we currently recognize today. The principles that compose this video make up a significant component of the training that we provide to our hypnotherapy and psychotherapy students spread out across the world. Steve and Pauline have been working on their model for over 40 years, having been supported in their endeavor by Professor George Engel, Professor Ernest Rossi, Dr. Anthony Stevens, Dr. Peter Nixon, and Franz Jung, among many more. In May of 1992, they made a promise to Franz Jung, Carl Jung's only son, in his father's home, that they would bring his father's work, Carl Jung's work, into the reach of ordinary people. They continue to make true to that promise to this very day. I am being personally mentored by Steve and Pauline, and am working very closely with them on the genomic and quantum informational correlates to the observed psychodynamics in psychosystems analysis. As someone who actively worked in scientific research, and indeed still does, psychosystems analysis is the only modality of depth psychology that I have ever seen which openly welcomes, nay, encourages through dialectical syncretism, cutting edge biochemical and quantum biological insights whilst keeping its therapeutic focus on the relational dynamics with fellow human beings. For that, it is surely the psychotherapy of the future. Although today we have only had time for, in the final analysis, a very broad overview, we hope this video thesis has been enjoyable and informative for you. What is a person? Indeed, what is the nature of being human? Together, collectively, we surely know a lot. But there is still a long way to go. The future beckons. Take care, and see you soon.